the work that, that Beck has done uh, is, is such a great example of illustration of what the Pulitzer Center is about because we are very much about collaborations and doing whatever we can to extend the conversation to, to uh, maximize the impact of the reporting that's done on big systemic issues around the world that affect us all. And so in Beck's case, uh, she uh, came to us. She was a Harvard Law School graduate, Kennedy School graduate, uh, worked at the International Criminal Court for a couple of years on Sudan issues, uh, has been a fellow at the New America Foundation, uh, tremendously well versed in this. As you can see, I mean, her book is outside, Fighting for Darfur, which is a a fabulous book and I recommend it highly. Uh, we got together so that she could, the idea was to do sustained coverage of, of Sudan and, and, and we came up with a plan where, where we commissioned her to go on multiple trips to Sudan beginning last summer uh, through the referendum. So three trips so far, about what, four or five weeks uh, each trip uh, at a time when, when at best most news organizations even on an issue as important and big as the referendum on independence for southern Sudan, uh, might get a day or two or three here and there. And, and, and there's just not enough correspondence, not enough resources to go around. So the idea here was to have somebody with expertise on the issue to have sustained opportunity to, to write about it. And, and out of that work has come. Then we, then we took, we, Beck and I took it to the Washington Post, and, and they, in their wisdom, agreed to make her a special correspondent for the duration of this project. And so they've, you've seen, what, six or seven stories that she's done throughout the year for the Washington Post. But meanwhile, she's also written for foreign policy, for foreign affairs, for New Republic, for Christian Science Monitor, for Slate. She's all over the place. And she's, she's, she really uh, has been, to my mind, the authoritative voice on, on, on what has happened and is happening in Sudan at this very momentous period in its history. It is a pleasure for me as well to introduce what I think is going to be an excellent panel uh, to discuss what is a very timely subject after the vote challenges and opportunities uh, for a two-state Sudan. Uh, I'd like to start off with uh, Rebecca Hamilton. Of, of the majority of people who didn't believe that the referendum that we saw last month could happen on time, let alone as successfully and, and peacefully as it happened. I think it's really important to, to celebrate this moment of success and enormous credit to the representatives of the government of Sudan, the government of Southern Sudan, the international community that also got behind it, um, and most of all, the Southern Sudanese people. It was an incredible month to be there uh, and to witness literally history in the making. I was in Benchu in Unity State the day that the polls opened. People had started queuing at 3 o'clock in the morning. And it wasn't because they were going to miss out on voting. Voting was open for a week. But everyone wanted to be there first. Um, and the, the image that will stay with me forever was by midday on, on the first day of polling. And it's, it's dry season, very, very, very hot. And I was just leaving one of the polling stations. Uh, it was basically a, a church that had been bombed out during the war. There's not a lot of infrastructure in the south, and so they were putting up polling stations wherever there was any kind of infrastructure. And I saw a young boy pushing a wheelbarrow. And it seemed like a strange thing to be doing up to a polling station. I got a little closer and saw that in the wheelbarrow was this woman and she was writhing in pain, visible, visible pain. Her legs were wasted, uh, they were curled up underneath her. And as I came over, uh, one of, obviously, her family members came and said, we know there's something wrong with her, we know she's very, very sick, we know that she needs to try and get some medical care, but she wouldn't let us do anything until at first we had taken her to vote. And that was a, a, a variations on that story were something that I heard from a lot of other journalists who were there covering southern Sudan at this time. This incredible will of the people to do whatever it took to finally exercise their vote. Uh, seen as a vote for freedom, a choice that they were making not only for themselves but for their children and for their grandchildren. You don't have to scratch the surface or go back very far in history, though, to know that southern Sudan is also full of its own deep divisions. And that as much as there was a north-south war, there was also an internal southern war. There were different rebel groups 
funded in large part by Khartoum. Um, but I think that there is only going to be a limited window in which the, the new government of southern Sudan is going to be able to deliver on citizens' expectations before they get frustrated. And the risk is that instead of turning to their government, when the government for them has never been the place to turn when you need something, instead of turning to their government, they revert back to their own ethnic group for protection. Um, there is a, a huge arms problem across southern Sudan, and so a huge risk of internal conflict in the south. There's one uh, message that I can send home with you tonight. It is that we need to continue to focus on the future of the north. And there's a lot of, of excitement and a lot of uh, focus on the south, and, and the project of building a new state is, is certainly exciting. Um, but something like 75% of Sudan's population will remain in northern Sudan. Uh, and those people deserve attention, and there are still, as we all know, a lot of real challenges and, and problems going on in the north. There is a concentration of a lot of power and resources at the core of the country, which is Khartoum and the immediate environment and the marginalization of a lot of the peripheral parts of Sudan, be it the south or Darfur, or even some of the eastern and northern parts of Sudan. And while the um, secession of southern Sudan is going to address that to some extent in the south, it doesn't address that core problem at all in the remaining northern part of Sudan. Uh, the North's problems do not go away with Southern secession. In the last five years especially, certainly the last six months, we've made up a lot of ground. But, but even when you go to Juba, um, you know, the reporting is always that Juba is a boom town. Uh, and that's certainly true now uh, and has been for the last year or so. Um, but, you know, five years ago, there was no government of Southern Sudan. Uh, and we have to remember that, that we've, we've really created or they've created something out of nothing. Um, and so when we talk about uh, a dearth of capacity uh, and, you know, 85 percent illiteracy, there's, there's no question that those are, those are huge, huge challenges um, that, we, that we collectively have to overcome in Sudan. Um, but it's, it's certainly not, uh, it's not lost on me and uh, it should not be lost on anyone that, um, that the South has done a great deal to prepare uh, for its own uh, independence and statehood. And so, uh, as, a, as, as, as a representative of government on this panel, we uh, are thinking very hard about the things that we need to do to help uh, maintain that galvanized support for, uh, for the South going forward, um, and, that, and that we need to serve in a coordinating capacity and a, and a mobilizing capacity uh, to help the South uh, succeed going forward. This is a time when the, we have uh, big challenges in Sudan overcome by uh, uh, big uh, decisions by the leaders in the, in the north and south. When many people, even what they said, they were uh, expecting this time of, of uh, war and violence, it comes to change to a time of peace and celebration of uh, accepting the realities of uh, emerging new state and people uh, they came to congratulate uh, each other on this uh, peaceful outcome of the referendum and the, to sit together in uh, committees forged between the north and the south to, to discuss these challenges, which is uh, really serious. The vision that we are having in the government of southern Sudan is to make sure that these two states are viable. Uh, you know, our relations uh, between the North and the South is very important because if we are going to have a failed state in the North, it is going to affect us also. And the same thing with, uh, with us. If we are going to be a, a failed state in the South, it will also affect the, the North.